Hello my fellow engineers. It's September, 1940, and Germany wanted to crush the spirits of the citizens of United Kingdom during the Battle of Britain. But one aircraft stood as a symbol of a British resilience and gave hope to its citizens, the Supermarine Spitfire, defended the skies day and night from Nazi attacks, showing that the Brits won't bow its knee against anyone. This aircraft gave the Germans its first defeat on the battlefield and by many is considered the turning point during the Second World War. The Spitfire became a symbol of hope, embodying the spirit of those who fought for freedom. Join us on a journey through history as we unravel the story of the Spitfire, a true icon of the aviation world. Our story begins in the 1930s in United Kingdom when Air Ministry was in need of a new fighter that was able to fly to speeds up to 250 miles per hour. At the Supermarine factory, a visionary designer R. J. Mitchell sought to create a fighter aircraft that would redefine aerial warfare. Mitchell's vision materialized in the form of the Spitfire, featuring an innovative design with elliptical wings, a powerful engine, and unmatched agility. Starting with the Type 22 for prototype and moving to K505 for prototype, the Supermarine Spitfire was born. Beyond its elegant design, the Spitfire was a technological marvel. Its Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and innovative features set it apart, making it a formidable force in the skies. One of the most innovative solutions at the time was the elliptical wing design. The designers were looking for a solution for aircraft to have enough lifting force, but to also accommodate the guns and lading gear in the wings. The semi-elliptical wing design was chosen as it was the most suitable solution. An elliptical planform is the most efficient aerodynamic shape for an untwisted wing, leading to the lowest amount of induced drag. The ellipse was skewed so that the center of pressure, which occurs at the quarter cord position, aligned with the main spar preventing the wings from twisting. A wing feature that contributed greatly to its success was an innovative spar boom design, made up of five square tubes that fitted into each other. As the wing thinned out along its span, the tubes were progressively cut away in a similar fashion to a leaf spring. Two of these booms were linked together by an alloy web, creating a lightweight and very strong main spar. The wing had a washout feature which acted as a safety feature. The wings were slightly twisted upward, which made the base of the wing to stall before the tips. That way, before a complete stall, the aircraft started to shake letting the pilot know about a possible stall and giving him time to assess the situation. All the main flight controls were originally metal structures with fabric covering. Designers and pilots felt that having ailerons, which required a degree of effort to move at high speed would avoid unintended aileron reversal throwing the aircraft around and potentially pulling the wings off. Air combat was also felt to take place at relatively low speeds, and high-speed maneuvering would be physically impossible. Flight tests showed the fabric covering of the ailerons ballooned at high speeds, adversely affecting the aerodynamics. Replacing the fabric covering with light alloy dramatically improved the ailerons at high speed. Also the plane has light alloys flaps, with two positions, fully up or fully down, which seemed enough at the time, for an airplane that was built during World War II. Now, the Spitfire has a magnificent Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, and it was a carbureted engine on purpose. You see, unlike the Messerschmitt planes that had direct injection, when the fuel is fed before the supercharger, it evaporates and cools the air down by 25 degrees. You might think what it has to do with the aircraft, but that cooled air increases the performance of the supercharger and gives the engine more power, increasing the speed and agility of the aircraft. It's a simple and ingenious solution to have more power and performance, but it all came at a cost. The plane couldn't nose dive. In negative G, the fuel was forced out of the carburetor and the engine would stop what is also known as fuel starvation in aircrafts, and it took precious time for pilots to restart the engine. The Luftwaffe pilots learned that and they would just nose dive in a fight to evade the Spitfire, while the Royal Air Force pilots had to do a half roll before a dive in order to not stall the engine. But don't worry, in 1941, a British aeronautical engineer by the name of Beatrice Schilling 
invented a metal disc with a hole that was fitted in the fuel line, which restricting fuel flow to the maximum the engine could consume, and eliminating fuel starvation. This was later known as Miss Schilling's orifice. Later were introduced pressure carburetors that were designed to allow fuel to flow during all altitudes. At a conference, a scientific officer Captain Gunnerhill presented charts, based on his calculations showing that future fighters must carry no fewer than eight machine guns, each of which must be capable of firing 1,000 shots a minute. As you know, Hill's assistant in making his calculations had been his teenage daughter. So what engineers did, you ask? They fitted for machine guns on the plane because of the shortage of the Brownings, but later were updated the machine guns to eight for each aircraft. But as usual with new projects, the pilots quickly noticed that the machine guns, while working perfectly at low altitudes, were frequently freezing at high altitudes. Brownings had been modified to fire from an open bolt. While this prevented overheating of the cordite used in British ammunition, it allowed cold air to flow through the barrel and hindered. To fix that, engineers adopted new air ducts that went from radiators to gun bays in order to trap heat around the machine guns. Later red fabric patches were doped around to protect the gun from moisture and dirt until it was fired. Also the Spitfire was able to carry two 250-pound bombs or one 500-pound bomb for its bombing missions and tow RP-3 rockets. As you see, the aircraft was always improving after listening to the feedback of the pilots. Even before delivering the planes to the Royal Air Force, Alex Henshaw, a chief test pilot with a team of 25 pilots tested every plane, trying to reach maximum altitude, max speed and different aerial maneuvers to assure the aircraft performs as it should. Alex Henshaw flew 10% of the total Spitfire production. The continuous evolution of the Spitfire showcased the dedication of engineers and pilots to stay ahead of the curve. Today, the Spitfire's legacy lives on. Pilots and aviation enthusiasts from around the world cherish the opportunity to witness the iconic aircraft in action. The Spitfire was used in several roles, including interceptor, photo reconnaissance, fighter bomber, and trainer, and it continued to do so until the 1950s. The Spitfire has transcended its wartime origins, becoming a symbol of passion for aviation history. As we conclude our journey through the annals of aviation history, the Super Marine Spitfire stands as a testament to human ingenuity and courage. Its graceful silhouette continues to capture the hearts of those who marvel at its wings of valor. Thank you for joining us on this tribute to the Super Marine Spitfire. Don't forget to subscribe for more stories that celebrate the extraordinary achievements of our past.